Hi everyone, we're back finally. Sometimes it takes me a little bit to get new content uploaded because my day job is being a film composer. So if I'm on a movie and there's a deadline, then sometimes for, you know, six weeks, two months, I just don't have time to create more. Uh, I try to get a backlog of content that I can keep uploading throughout that time, but sometimes it's just not possible. So bear with me. Sometimes there are gaps in my upload schedule. That's just how it's going to be. So a lot of people have been asking me questions on social media or in the comment section, uh, and some of them warrant a separate video. Some of them, however, I think I can do in a kind of quick round, and that's what this video is going to be. It's going to be ran random questions that people sent to me, and I will be giving very quick answers to it, kind of like a Q&A. So the first question that I got the most, really, which is funny to me because I didn't think this was unclear, is how do you number cues? So the system usually is you will have a number, then M, and another number. So the first number is the real number. Usually a movie is broken up into reels that are each 18 to 20 minutes in length, Sometimes we don't do that anymore now. It's not really necessary, but there are advantages to still break up the movie. And so the real number is telling you what reel the cue is from. And then M stands for music cue. The number after that, you just basically start at one and you just count all the way to the end of the movie. You can watch my uh, spotting sessions and cue sheets video uh, where I discuss this a little bit and you can see how it's done but this is the gist of it. Uh, the M is important because it identifies that it's a music cue. So at the end, when you send all of your cues to the dub stage for the final mix, other departments from you know, the sound department are going to be sending their files as well, and they will have their unique identifiers as well. So that way, this massive audio session that they have at the end is going to be a little less messy because there are these little identifiers on the cues. The name R2D2, for example, comes from Real 2 Dialogue Track 2, R2D2. I don't know how sound effects people name their stuff and how Foley people name their stuff. If you're a Foley artist or sound effects person, you can answer that in the comments if you like. But all of us have these unique identifiers so that the dub mixer has an easier time identifying what's in which file. Question number two. Do you use a single DAW session for the whole movie? Oh my god, no. No. Do not do that. That is insane. I mean, if you want to make your life really hard, by all means, but um, no. If it's a short film, 10 minutes or less, an argument could be made for it. But other than that, for a whole feature film, no. You usually have roughly between 30 and 60 pieces of music in an average length feature film. So that would just be insane. The reason also being, I mean, you get different picture edits. You need to conform cues to that picture edit. It would just be such a mess to have everything in one session. And then if that one session gets corrupted, what do you do? I mean, ideally you have backups, but you know, maybe you just did a lot of work and something crashes and gets corrupted. It, it just seems very risky to have everything in one session and very inconvenient for any types of edits or conforms. It would be terrible for session prep if you have live sessions and you need to send stuff to your orchestrator. That seems like a nightmare to prepare because then you would have to break everything up. And then it also, I mean, it seems like a nightmare for stem printing, for basically anything down the line would be a complete nightmare if you did that. Also, something that wouldn't work, something that I do a lot is every cue needs some little thing that is different from another cue. Something I do in ozone on the master fader that just needs to be different for a soft cue compared to an action cue. Sometimes I load a unique instrument just for a handful of cues, or in some cues I want the piano to have a specific effect on it, and others I don't. You can't really do that if you have everything in one session. So this just seems highly inconvenient and is just um, a recipe for chaos, I would say. 
again, you do you, but I have never seen that. I have worked at probably 10 different composer studios and I've never seen anybody do that. Question number three, why are so many scores in the same key throughout the movie? I mean, first of all, every composer I think has their favorite key to write in. For me, it's E minor. For some people, it's D minor. Um, I think everybody has their thing. You will find a lot of my scores to actually be in E minor. There are different reasons why it's handy to keep the score roughly in the same key throughout. I didn't used to do that and I learned this the hard way, um, but here are the reasons why. First of all, most of my scores have life recording. So you want to be in specific keys to um, make, make it easy for the players. They're sight reading. They're often sight reading at high speeds. They only have often two or three takes to get the thing done. So you don't want to write in, you know, E flat minor, especially also because most of the orchestra is comprised of string players who like to play in specific keys like E minor. You want to make this easy for the players. I usually tell my additional writers, try and stay in this key. You can modulate wherever you want, but try to also, if you modulate, into a key that is playable for the sight readers that we have at the session. So you really, you really want to stay away from something like E flat minor. It's also, it'll, it'll give you tuning issues. It's, it's not the greatest idea to write in complicated keys. Even if you go to prime locations like London, of course you can write in those keys, but it's just not a good idea. I mean, don't make it extra hard, especially if you have fast music that is complicated music to play, try and at least make it easy, you know, key wise. And then, of course, there's the music editing aspect. First of all, um, some cues are entirely music edited, and you're going to have an easier time doing that if your score is mostly in the same key. Or um, a situation that I have on pretty much every movie is that I will get requests from the dub stage. They're doing the mix, and then they're noticing, ah, you know what, this cue and context, we actually would like something else there. They will reach out to me and ask if I can do an edit. I will have a much easier time making that edit and drawing from other material in the score if it's in the same key. It's always a nightmare if I have the perfect thing that could go into that scene, but then it's in a different key. I have to write a transition over. It's, it's messy. It's much easier to just, you know, also if you have a music editor, of course, they would prefer that, I would think. Sometimes you give people an alt version of a cue. It's easier to create an alt version if, you know, you're in the same key. Very often the music editor or the composer is the one to edit the credit roll. That's not necessarily original music. Sometimes for the main cards, it's original music, but then um, the actual role is a music edit of the score. Very often I'm the one doing that and it's much more helpful if everything's in one key because it's so hard to create a credit medley if everything's in a different key. And then of course you also have the soundtrack edits. Very often I'm also the person editing the soundtrack and cues have been left off of soundtracks of mine because someone didn't write all the cues in the same key. And then sometimes if there's one cue that is in a completely different key from everything else, and I couldn't find a way to edit it into the score, and it's just a 30 second cue of brilliance, it'll still get cut from the album because I couldn't find a way to actually incorporate that into a track. And we usually want tracks to be longer than 30 seconds, of course. So not a good idea in general to, um, to do this. What I will often do if I have a long scene also, in order to keep it interesting and not have everything be exactly in the same key, is I will, for example, a lot of the animated movies I've done, they have this massive end fight at the end with, you know, roughly 10, 15, 20 minutes of music in one go. We break that scene up into smaller parts and if uh, I, assign some of those parts to my additional writers, I will let them know 
try to end in this key or that key so that we can taper that over into the next scene because our all of our cues will at the end amount to one big piece so there has to be some communication but it's obviously much easier if you just say okay within the cue you can go wherever you want to go but start it in e and end it in e or on the dominant to e so that it tapers well into the next thing that the other person is doing so this is also a consideration. If there's good communication between the writers, you can jump around between keys and create, you know, a lot more modulation. But if you have extreme time constraints, it's just much easier to go, look, we're gonna be in this key in general, and then you can go wherever you wanna go, but return to that key, please. Question number four. I see you're using the contact perch function a lot. Does this interfere with your playback? Yes and no. Um, I am using the contact perch function. That is correct. Um, for those that don't know what this is, when you load an instrument into contact, it will load a lot of uh, the sample heads into your RAM so that it can access all the files that it needs very quickly. Um, and if you purge, I can show in a screen grab how that's done, where you can find that function. It'll basically kick all that out of the RAM, which means you have more RAM available, which is nice. I think I don't always want everything loaded right away because I don't always need all the samples at all times. So um, what I will do is I will basically have my Vienna Ensemble Pro MetaFrame booted up and everything is perched in it. And so then what happens as I'm using instruments, contact will load all the samples, but just the samples that I actually need, the ones that I'm using, it'll load them in real time. On first playback, there might be, you know, some pops and clicks or, you know, missing samples, and that's fine. That's kind of the side effect. But once everything that you used is also loaded, you don't have any problems. So I very much prefer that because it reduces load times and um, it stresses the, the system a little less and I never need to worry about RAM, you know, running short. Um, you don't have to do that, you know, you, you can you cannot use that function, but I have not had any issues with it and I really, really like that it has this feature. You can also first load everything, then compose your piece and then click on um, update sample pool, I think it is. And it'll basically just purge all the samples from the RAM that have not been used in your piece. So you can also do it that way around. But yeah, I really like that function. I think it's super helpful with load times. It's super helpful easing up on the RAM and your system. So um, especially if you're low on RAM, I would definitely recommend using that. Question number five. I keep getting stuck notes that seem to go on forever. How do you solve this? Yes, this is a problem with, I think, all libraries. I randomly have it, I mean, some libraries have it a little bit worse than others, but all of the libraries that I have have had that issue at some point. The way to solve it is fairly simple. You go into wherever this is happening and you click on the exclamation mark. That will reset the engine, it'll reset the script. And when you do that, the standing note will cut out. It'll Take a moment to reset, probably, I would say five seconds, maybe, maybe 10 seconds if you have a slow system, but that problem is solved that way and it won't happen again, likely. Question number six, my V Pro interface is garbled upon boot up. Why is that? Oh, this takes me back to CineSamples customer support. That question came up a lot. This is not a bug. It's, a, it's just how this program works. Um, when you boot up Vienna Ensemble Pro and you load uh, contact into it, for example, that has libraries loaded into it, you will see that the um, graphic interface of all the libraries is garbled and you can't actually click on anything or do anything with it. That's because Vienna Ensemble Pro is not a DAW. It does not initiate the script or anything in it. It's just kind of a hosting software. So you need to connect it to a digital audio, audio workstation. And once that connection is made, you will see automatically how everything becomes ungarbled because that program will read the script and that will read the audio interface and will 
activate everything that you need. So this is not really a bug. Some people think it's a bug. It's just how the program works. It's supposed to work like that. So yeah, just connect it to your DAW and it's going to be fine. Question number seven. This is one that I actually get a lot. How do you solve layering libraries that were recorded in different rooms? How do you make them blend? I don't, really. It's, it's not really a problem. It's an imaginary problem, I think, that a lot of teachers seem to be talking about, specifically teachers that aren't working composers, because the moment you actually do this in practicality, it's not really an issue. One way that I do it is I, um, I do turn off the reverb in all of the libraries and then put the same reverb in my DAW on everything. That'll glue it together a little bit. If the library has excessively long releases, I will shorten them a little bit so that it doesn't negatively stand out compared to the other libraries. If something really sticks out, which I honestly haven't had yet, at least not in the higher end libraries, um, you could start using the other mic positions. I often really only use the, the full mix, live mix version that came with it, but you can use the other mic positions, of course, if something's not blending well, go for it. But I don't find that to be particularly necessary. I think the key here is proper volume balance. If I balance the libraries in proper volume, then I don't usually have any of these issues. It's the same way if I have live recording and I layer that into the mock-up or I layer the mock-up into the live recording, depending on how you want to see that. It's usually a question of volume balance. There will be that one point where you go 2 dB louder and all of a sudden it sticks out. So you go back by 2 dB. The way I've been balancing my libraries, for example, I'm using different string libraries on top of each other. So the way I've been doing that is I take the one that I want to hear the most and I bring that to a really nice bass level. Then I take the one that I want to hear the second most that will fill in the gaps of that first library. And I bring that to a nice volume level compared to the first one. And then I go further down the line. If I have solo strings, for example, I don't want to actively hear them. They're just there to give it that slight crunch. Um, so the volume balance between those is way more important than, you know, figuring out reverb or figuring out, um, you know, reverb tails or re releases. It, it doesn't really do that much. As long as the volumes are correct, you're going to have an easier time gluing it all together. One way to also glue a mix together is using tape saturation. That's always a good trick. It, it kind of is the glue between the all the parts. So that often helps it a little bit. A, a bit of parallel compression can help, but these are minor things that I do. Um, the number one thing is get the volume balances right so that nothing sticks out. What's better, tempo change or meter change? It depends. In general, you want to do meter changes with live instruments. Uh, if you don't record, obviously it doesn't matter. But um, meter change is usually better because those studio players are used to a ton of meter changes, so they don't really care. They just play through those as if it's nothing. Um, in, in your mind, it might be complicated. In their minds, it's absolutely not complicated. So go for the meter change if you can. I feel like 90% of... Um, changes in my music can actually be solved with a meter change instead of a tempo change. You can do tempo changes um, in specific ways. You can, if it's within 10 BPM, most studio players can do that. It's not really an issue. Another way to do it is if it's a drastic tempo change, you can either do a tempo ramp over time if that works and doesn't sound weird, or you can do the tempo change on a sustain. So you can either um, go into the new tempo, say we're going from um, really slow to really fast, make sure that on the tempo change, the players have a sustain so that they can basically hear the new tempo while they're sustaining a note. And then once they have to do rhythmic stuff, they're already in the new tempo. Or alternatively, 
you can do the tempo change, uh, you can do a sustain before the tempo change and give them warning clicks in the new tempo. But that requires a bit more prep, so I'd be careful with that. And it needs to be put into the score, they need to see that this is what was going to happen, otherwise they're going to be confused. If you can't do either one of those, you're just going to have to punch in, meaning at the stage you're going to have to say we're going to record up to here and then we're going to start here in the new tempo. Which is fine too, it just costs more time so you try to avoid it if you can. And of course something that always works is double tempo or half tempo, that's fairly easy to do as well. Is social media a good way to reach out to composers? It depends. Um, first of all, properly introduce yourself. Treat this seriously. Treat this like an application or like a formal introduction to someone. Too often I get people just either immediately bombarding me with music without even introducing themselves. They're just like, hey, thanks for connecting. Here's my music. Or sometimes they don't write anything at all and just start sending music. Sometimes I get people just saying hi and nothing else and I'm like There's nothing I can say to that <laughs> What what do you want me to do with that? Um, so properly introduce yourself state your purpose. Why are you connecting? What do you want? You know, just Just be a human. Okay Try at least try try to write in proper sentences not in some you know, really loose language. If you need someone to proofread your stuff, maybe have someone proofread your stuff. It shows that you care. If someone doesn't even care how they speak to me and how they write to me, whether it's a native speaker or non-native speaker, um, it just shows how much they care about communicating with you. So maybe be a little more formal than you would be normally on social media. But also if the person has a professional page, a web page or a professional social media page, maybe use that to reach out. That might be a better idea, mainly because if you write to me on social media and we're not connected, it's highly likely that it's going to go into my spam folder or my filtered messages. And I only check those maybe once a month. So I will not see your message essentially. So be careful with that. If you write to my professional page or you write to me through my website, it'll go into my inbox and I will see it. But so, yeah, it, it can be a good way. I have, um, I have actually hired people from them reaching out to me and then we met for, you know, lunch and we got along and, you know, it, it takes a moment, you know. I'm not just going to hire someone because they reached out to me on social media and dropped me a message, but, um, if we can actually connect and have a proper conversation and you actually bring skills and I'm actually in need of those skills, I don't see a particular issue with it. I mean, be polite and be understanding. Sometimes I don't get back to people, probably for, for weeks sometimes, sometimes a whole month. It will be in my inbox and I will see it and it will stress me out <laughs> because I know I have to get back to people you know, because I try not to be rude. Um, but if I'm on a movie, I'm on a movie and that takes my entire bandwidth and then any non-essential communication just will have to wait until after. Sometimes I manage to drop people a message and go, hey, reach out to me four weeks from now because then I'm going to be done with this movie. Up until then, I don't really have time for you, unfortunately. But yeah, be understanding that if you reach out to a professional, they might not have time for you immediately. And also, do follow up. Don't follow up every day. I, I get that sometimes that people follow up with me within 24 hours and I'm like, give me a moment. Um, so do follow up with people, maybe after two weeks, three weeks, you know, just drop them a message again, just going, hey, just wanted to reach out again. I know you're busy, um, so, you know, no pressure, just wanted to bump this up in your inbox. You know, that's that's perfectly fine. Nobody's gonna rip your head off for that. Be concise, state your purpose, and be a little more formal maybe than you normally would be. Um, and also check out the person that you're writing to if you don't know them, because 
I so often get people um, that write to me and they send me, you know, an EDM track. And I'm like, that's great, but that's not what I do. I write orchestral film scores. So you sending an EDM track to me kind of really doesn't do anything for me. It's not something that I most likely am going to need anytime soon. Um, it's not what I do. So I'm not really sure why that communication happened. Check out the person that you're writing to. Check out what they're doing so that you don't send them stuff that they're most likely not going to need. Is an IMDb profile important? Yes, it is. If you're a film composer, that is. IMDb is probably the first thing I check out. And IMDb is probably the first thing that most people in the film industry check out first. So I would definitely do that. I would definitely get a profile. Um, I, I'd probably get a pro account um, because it's kind of like your professional, um, it's, it's your calling card pretty much. And you want, you want that to be updated as well. You want your credits to be in there um, and to, for it to be complete. What's the best piece of advice for aspiring composers? Um, I mean, there's a lot. Maybe I'll, I'll do a whole video on that. But I think the number one thing for me is probably get your music out there. Because I see a lot of composers, you know, applying for jobs. I mean, I've also worked at other studios and I was the one going through applications. So this is not just from my company. I've just seen a lot of people that it's so easy to put music out there for free these days. And yet a lot of people don't do it. And that's something I don't quite understand. You can use SoundCloud, you can use YouTube, you can use any, any service, Bandcamp, you can put your stuff on Spotify or Apple Music or Amazon. I mean, there are so many services that will distribute your music um, for a very small fee if you want that. Just do that, you know, write an album and put it out. Or, you know, write a piece a week, write a piece every two weeks and just put it out there. Write arrangements or do mock-ups of pieces that you like that maybe you didn't write. So many people have gotten jobs in this industry because some composer was just hanging out on YouTube or SoundCloud or wherever and just saw something and was like, oh wow, I need to hire this person. I should reach out to this person. I'm actually about to reach out to someone um, based on that, but also I've hired people based on that. If it was someone I was already connected with on social media somehow, and then I saw their stuff, they didn't even send it to me. I just saw it in my feed or I saw it because someone else shared it. And I was like, oh wow, I, I should reach out to this person. This person seems to be really good at this specific thing and I should ask them if they want to do this on my next movie where I'm going to need that. Sometimes it's not an immediate thing either. Sometimes it's just, I will remember that person um, much later on. So I, I won't need them right now, but then there's a specific production a year later and they just released that new single or something. And I'm like, oh, I remember that person. I should reach out to them because now I'm actually going to need them. Otherwise, I would have completely forgotten about that person if they hadn't consistently put out music and had been consistently on my radar. So I see a lot of people putting out stuff and then they don't put anything out for five years. That's not going to keep you on anyone's radar. And also, if I look at someone and the last thing they've published was five years ago, I don't assume that they are a working professional because if you were really into this, you would be publishing way more music because it's so easy to do. So I think that's the best thing you can do. Just put your stuff out there. Just write, produce, and put it out there, no matter what it is. Doesn't even, it doesn't even have to be perfect. It doesn't matter. I listen back to stuff from five years ago and I'm like, nah, I could do that better now, thankfully. But I remember I've gotten jobs from, you know, rescoring a scene and putting it up on YouTube. I've gotten jobs from um, the sample library demos that I wrote for Cine Samples. That was six years ago, I think now. 
And, you know, someone just reached out to me because they heard that and were like, I really liked that. I was buying this library and I heard your demo. I liked it. Do you want to do this project with me? So you never know when it's going to happen. It can be years before you reap the benefits of it, but you will never reap the benefits of it if you don't put it out there. Because then nobody's ever going to hear anything you've ever done and nobody's going to know about you. And they can't hire you if they don't know you exist. Now, there's been a lot of questions also about score analysis, music analysis, score breakdowns, melody, harmony, counterpoint, music theory and storytelling, orchestration, instrumentation. This is not really what this channel is intended to do. And I feel like some people here are asking me to uh, do their homework for them. You can do score analysis yourself. I mean, come on. Also, there are plenty of channels on YouTube that do score analysis um, and music theory, harmony, melody, whatever. I might do a couple of these as it pertains to my own music. I might do um, a walkthrough of one of the scenes that I've done and then give you a rundown of melody, harmony and that type of thing. I could do that. I can see that happening. But I'm not going to cram four years of a bachelor's study into this YouTube channel. I mean, just... Go to school if you want to know this stuff. <laughs> Read a book. There are plenty of books out there on music theory and composition and anything really. So just do that. Just do it. Orchestration. Yes, I can, I can get into orchestration and I probably will in relation to my orchestrator and how we work and how he works and what he does um, and how he uses Sibelius and Finale and Dorico in combination with film scoring, but orchestration in general, I might do a video on what I often do, maybe, but I will not be giving free orchestration classes on my YouTube channel. First of all, again, there are channels that do orchestration, so just look for them. But also just read The Study of Orchestration. It's a very large book that we read in school. Just read it. It'll take a while, but you know, you'll know a lot after that and just practice it. Just look how it's applied in actual music. Um, there's also another book that I really like, um, the Korsakoff book. It has some outdated stuff in it, but um, it's still a very good book because it talks a little bit more, not just about the individual sections, but also how the interplay between the sections works, which I like. The study of orchestration is really more focused on the individual sections and instruments and how they work. But yeah, a lot of this stuff, I, I will cover some of it, but don't expect this channel to turn into a full-on classical music theory counterpoint channel. I mean, there's a reason why composition is a four-year study at most conservatories. Counterpoint is not something that I can condense into a 10-minute quick bite video. I mean, first of all, what counterpoint? Renaissance? Baroque? classical, neoclassical. This is not something that can be done in, you know, even just in a short video series. I mean, again, there are plenty of books on counterpoint. Just read them. It's fine. You can do your homework. You can do this. I know you can. There have also been some uh, requests to talk about problem solving, work ethics, or opinion-based pieces. I will start doing opinion-based pieces. I've been hesitant about that because that can escalate really quickly into what I don't want this channel to become. So there will be opinion-based pieces that I will do, but that will be rooted in facts and experience because I'm not just going to turn on this microphone and just start rambling on and on. That's not really what I intend to do. There's plenty of composer channels that do that. If you want to watch, you know, a composer rant on for an hour. You can find plenty of other composers that will do that, but that's not really what I like to do. That's not really what I like to watch. I like everything to be planned out, to be properly edited, to be researched, and to be um, as concise as it can be. Because I want this to be useful, but I also don't want to waste people's time. So. Make of that what you will. But there will be video essays on my part in the future, near future, that will be more opinion-based pieces. Yes. I hope this was helpful. Um, 
I will do more of these, of course. Uh, the more people send me questions that can be answered quickly, the more of these, you know, quick bite videos I will do. So I hope this was helpful and I hope this answered some people's questions that they've been asking. Um, and I'm looking forward to the next one. Do, do write to me or comment on this video and then I will incorporate your next series of questions. Um, often I will also use my Instagram stories to ask for questions. So if you're not following me on Instagram, maybe do that if you want to drop some questions there. Um, and let's do this again. <laughs>